Remember, we're live on Facebook. Mm, that's great, I guess. We can start whenever you're ready. Yeah, I think let's start. Sure. It's live, no? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, from behalf of Cooper Surgical, I welcome you all and to the web uh, webinar on male infertility, a cause for concern with IFS SIG Holistic Health. First of all, I'm really thankful to Indian Infertility Society, President Dr. Katie Nair, Secretary Dr. Sabine Bhuman, who is joining us today. Thank you, ma'am. And that, as well as the conveners of SIG Holistic Health, Dr. Rajiv Mehta, who convener Dr. Shalini Chawla. Thank you, Team IFS and IFS SIG, for giving us the opportunity to be part of this uh, really nice and educational webinar. So we'll start this program. I'll introduce our co-convener for SIG Holistic Health, Dr. Shalini Chawla Khanna. She's a senior IVF and laparoscopic consultant with Max Hospital in Delhi and NCR. She's the general secretary for Delhi uh, Gynecology and Fertility Society 22 and 24. She's executive member of IFS since 2020. She's also on editorial board of Journal of Case Reports and Images of Optimism. That's, okay, that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> over to you, Dr. Shalini. So I'll yeah. play the next CV. Uh, so you yeah. can introduce Thank our you. secretary for IFS. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Cooper Surgical, uh, for giving us this opportunity to be on board for such an important topic today, uh, especially the male infertility. Uh, may, uh, infertility is on the rise, be it male and female. And the causes we know are many. There is an exposure to environmental toxins, obesity, stress, stress at work, stress at interpersonal relations. And then there is an addiction to smoking, alcohol. So uh, just to give a brief idea about our uh, SIG, this is the special interest group under the ages of Indian Fertility Society, where we take the patients, where we approach the patients in total. We not only discuss and tell them about the cause of the infertility, but we guide them holistically. We tell them about the healthy lifestyles, balanced diet, maintaining good emotional and mental stability and how to avoid stress. You know, it's kind of a vicious circle. The stress increases, the fertility rise uh, increases, there is a rise in infertility, and again, that builds up the stress. And there is definitely a role of meditation. So basically, we take the patient in total. And uh, we've been doing successful webinars. We've been guiding them. The last ones, we've been doing it on PCOS, uh, clearing their myths, and probably, we would be going ahead with many more to come. And with that, my pleasure to invite Professor Suveen Guman Sindhu. She is the Director, Head IVF and of Reproductive Medicine Center at Max Healthcare. Uh, I'm very closely associated with her. We both work at the same place. And the more I say, the less it is for her. Uh, we all have seen where she has taken, she is the Secretary General of the Indian Fertility Society. We all have seen that she has taken the IFS to a great height. She's doing a commendable job. She's reaching out to all the peripheries and making the people and doctors aware and writing the correct prescriptions. So I guess the list is endless and I would be very brief. She has authored many books, many publications, many awards. So I thank you so much, Harvey. Thank you yeah. for the very warm uh, welcome and very uh, warm introduction. Yeah, so I would uh, just- so, And I would also like to say it's a pleasure working with Charlie. 
thank you so much one of the nicest people to work with. thank you so i would so, just request you dr surveet to give a warm welcome so i'll be brief but yes uh, indian fraternity society is moving ahead and it's moving ahead because of our sigs look at holistic medicine doing so well what great webinars what great attendance and uh, what great content in the webinar i think nobody has picked up this sig as well as uh, rajvi and chandni have done they have really brought it to the forefront picking up something like male infertility and holistic medicine i think uh, it's brilliant because there's so much attached to male infertility and the males refuse to become holistic that's the that's the whole uh, this thing so i think uh, this is a wonderful topic and we at ifsr are looking forward to more we are proud of all the webinars being conducted by our sigs uh, everybody is reaching out to the periphery i think our uh, this year our thing was quality research and academics and we have in many ways achieved it through all of you it was not us it was you who helped us do it thank you so much and let's move ahead to the webinar thank you dr sufin okay vakil okay. okay. yeah thank you ma'am so let me introduce our first speaker for today so we have with us dr rajiv mehta she is the academic consultant scientist for cooper surgical fertility solution and she is also the convener of ifs sig holistic health okay. uh, she will be speaking on a topic on other glo uh, global decline in sperm count uh, sperm counts which is i think really a hot topic now because even today i was meeting few people and they were discussing the same thing that there is a fall in fertility especially with respect to the male sperm counts and i think it will be a nice talk to her so dr rajvi is a phd from icm and institute of research reproduction mumbai yeah okay. so ma'am let me introduce you because i cannot uh, this is the cv and yeah, i see i feel very proud because i work under you So she worked with the team responsible for India's first scientifically documented IVF baby, led by Dr. T. C. Anand Kumar and Dr. Indira Hinduja in 1986. She is a recipient of SR Young Scientist Award in Year of Inception, and recently received the Champion of SR and President of SR Commendation Award. Also, she uh, contributed many chapters in textbooks in ART. She is the co-editor of ICMR's first manual in human semen analysis and IVF. She is executive member of ACE India. She is convener of SIG Holistic Medicine of India for Society, and she is one of the nicest person I know, and I and my teacher as well. Over to you, ma'am. I'm stopping my screen share and giving the right sheet. Thank Over you for you. the very elaborate uh, introduction, Vakil. Not required. <laughs> uh, so, firstly, it's a pleasure for me in this Infertility Awareness Week to start this SIG with a topic which is very rarely discussed. Uh, all of us working in the field of infertility over a period of time have seen, definitely seen, an increase in male infertility. So, in the early days when we used to talk about the prevalence of male infertility. one would always say it you know prevalence of infertility one would always say that the uh, the you know it was about 20% male 50% female etc and now if we go ahead to see we nearly see 50% of uh, infertility is due to the male factor and you know it is something which is so highly neglected to bring up uh, into point you know if we look the w, uh, the first ivf baby was born in 1978 but the first who semen analysis manual came in 1980 so that just shows how little importance we have given to the male and i feel it is due to human psychology of having security in numbers so most of the time one feels that uh, you know you have millions of sperms and all you need is one to penetrate into the oocyte so we have near i would honestly say we never really looked at it seriously even from social perception it is all about female infertility society still fortunately it has changed but still perceives infertility is a female problem they land up going more towards the gynecologist the number of investigations done on the female are plenty right from follicular monitoring hormone endocrine profile amh uh, maybe a diagnostic laparoscopy hysteroscopy and what do we do in the male a one semen analysis and most of the time we try to bypass uh, even if we talk of the number of andrologists in the country so in all aspects it's a very neglected field and like i said maybe we didn't really need to worry much about it and also for a long period of time a perception about reproductive health was mainly associated with sexually transmitted diseases and contraception all this put together has made it a very neglected field and today's topic which i'm going to be speaking about 
if something which is about global decline in sperm counts, first of all, is it is it really true? And is it a cause for concern? Because, you know, even if there is a decline from 90 million sperms per ml, if it goes down to 50 million, does it really matter in terms of fertility? So I would say that the interest in semen sperm count and looking at these aspects actually started in sometime in the 1990s when Kakabak and Sharp and Carlson, they actually published a paper in BMJ where they talked about decreasing quality of semen during the past 15 years. It was a paper which had, uh, you know, really caught the eyeballs, not only of the people working in the field of reproductive health, but even the common people. It made headlines onto common uh, magazines. And they had done a meta-analysis of 14,000 men across 66 papers published over a period of 50 years. And they reported that the sperm counts, mean sperm concentration had declined from 113 million per ml to 66 million, nearly six, uh, 40 to 50% decline. This research paper actually scared people that what are we heading for and what happens in the next 50 years. But the reality is that this paper had a lot of questions raised. First of all, if one assessed semen 50 years before this publication of the paper in 1993, why did they do it? Most of the time, it was not for infertility. It was in men undergoing vasectomy. It was in research studies. It was mainly to look for contraception. So the study group was very different. Second, so there was a lot of selection bias. Secondly, there was a lot of methodological variation in semen analysis. And even today, if you look at infertility clinics, they would not rely on a semen analysis report done by any kind of lab. They would prefer to do it themselves because of the methodological variation and how much the technology would have evolved for 50 years. So is it right to compare an analysis done in the 40s to analysis done in the 90s? And then there was a big issue with the statistical methodologies, which were, you know, there were errors and, you know, whether it was the right statistical analysis. So, well, the answer was that they, maybe there's not such a drastic decline as this paper showed. But one good thing that the paper did was that it caught about a massive media coverage and it triggered many laboratories to have a look at their own data. And what came across was that there was a conflicting or variable data across laboratories and it soon came into notice that there was a geographical variation in sperm counts between countries, between geographic locations and sometimes between geographic locations in the same country, clearly talking about many various roles could be dietary, environmental, which were affecting sperm counts. Now, working in this field, we ourselves, I was in Bangalore at that point of time, and, you know, looking at this paper, it triggered us to look at our own data because subjectively we felt that there was, you know, the number of people we saw with sperm concentration of 80 and 90 million, which was there in the early 90s and late 80s, we were not seeing it. Fortunately, we had the same technician and we had the same kind of uh, population that was coming to us. And what we noticed that over a period of five years, the, there was a sperm concentration, which was average 69 million per ml, actually decreased to 43 million per ml. And the prevalence of oligospermia in the infertile population that came to us for diagnosis and treatment had increased. And what we thought was, why was it so? I mean, why was this decline? Uh, were we, we, were not, we didn't believe that we were seeing a more biased population. We had not started ICSI, so to have more of oligo, oligo and isospermia. And then one thing which was very obvious in Bangalore at that point of time is the massive growth of Bangalore and a lot of construction activities. So, which was so obvious, the pollution level. So, uh, I remember going to the pollution control board and getting the data on the particulate matter, which was not very common at that point of time. Today, we get the information on the PM 2.5 count early, on an hourly basis. And we found that there was a, a difference, uh, uh, an increase in the SPM values over a period of time during the zone. And we had a classical kind of an association. Yes, it was an association. But what did that association mean? We cannot say that it was a cause and effect. To be very honest, at that point of time, I was very excited uh, to see this kind of data. And we actually were wondering that what happens to the traffic constables who are exposed to pollution at very high pollution levels on the streets. And we actually went about and gave a talk to them, uh, spoke to the police commissioner, and we had 800 of them coming to listen to us to, you know, and we sort of wanted to motivate them to be to have a semen analysis 
And we thought it would be really exciting to see that if they had already parented and had children and if the sperm counts had decreased, you know, we had a lot of uh, imagination and thought about what we would find. Uh, the point was that we had hardly five of these constables coming back to us for analysis and those who were in for time. So uh, we couldn't really pursue the study and we left it as an association. But the interest pursued. And even if you look at the current world data in the last, uh, published in the last two, three, five years, we find that this change is universal. So China primarily looked at the population of sperm donors. And what they found was that in 11 years of period of time, the sperm concentration and average sperm concentration of donors from 62 million had reduced to 32 million. Then if we looked at USA, where they looked at a different subgroup of patients, they looked at mainly subfertile men. And over a period of 20 years, they did not seem to see a change in the sperm concentrations. When one looked at North Africa, looking at over 20,000, 21,000 semen sample over a period of five years, they found that in all the basic semen parameters, which, took, which was uh, semen uh, sperm concentration, motility, uh, morphology, there was a decline on all fronts. And Europe looked at published data, uh, meta-analysis done over 50 years, and they found that there, there was a decrease, uh, uh, there was a 32.5% decrease in the sperm concentration. So overall, whether whichever continent one looks at, there appears to be a decline in sperm concentration. And I'm sure anybody who's working in the field in India or many parts of the world would agree who have been for a while that yes, there seems to be a decline and definitely there's an increase in the fertility, there's no doubt about that. So, we, you know, in a paper published in 2020, they looked at total mortal sperm counts because finally that is what is going to be associated with infertility. And one clearly sees that in 1995, where one had, uh, you know, uh, uh, the mortal sperm count of nearly 16 uh, million per ml has now gone down million, sorry, it's total mortal sperm, 16 million has actually started reducing over a period of time. And even if we look and categorize it with reference to age, it seems to be that there is a drastic decrease over a period of time. And it seems to have sort of started in the mid 90s and it's now reached really proportions uh, low proportions where it is a, actually a cause for concern. It has not gone down below the reference ranges or the confidence limits set by the, uh, 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 explained by the WHO in the recent manual. But surely, if you look at it over a period of time, there is a decline in the total motile sperm counts. China specifically had the, this paper was published in 2017, and they primarily looked at sperm donors over a period of seven years. And if we look, you know, the sperm concentrations, you can see from 2008 to 2014, from 86 million, there has been a gradual decline, 78, 68, 62 million per ml, going down in 2014 to 57 million per ml. However, the forward motility, progressive motility doesn't seem to be much affected. It is somewhere in the 50, 60%, but surely the total, total sperm count has also declined over a period of time. And this is a donor population, uh, which is not essentially coming in the infertile group. Now, there, if we accept, yes, there is a decline in sperm concentration over a period of time across the world in healthy people, in infertile couples, then what is it that has caused this decline? What has changed in the last 15, 20, 25 years to bring about this decline? I think first is uh, globalization has brought about dietary changes. Uh, also, you know, food which was locally available now can be uh, available, right? Uh, seasonally available is across available across the seasons. Also, occupations have changed from, you know, agrarian to more sedentary occupations. Physical activity has declined unless one has taken special efforts to have some physical activity. Even children have a more sedentary lifestyle. And thanks to the pandemic recently, the sedentary lifestyle has increased. Dietary habits, as I just mentioned, have changed drastically. While at a point of time, one would have fresh local food, it has now come to a situation that you can have food uh, which has been cooked long ago because we have better preservation facilities. You can have food which is not local. You can have food across continents. And there is an increased consumption of processed foods. And air pollution surely has raised climatic changes. I mean, the whole world is now worried about it. And environmental pollution has increased with pesticides, plastics, and sleep patterns. So yes, all this way, our lifestyle has changed. 
but is it really contributing in any way to male infertility or decrease in sperm count? So we'll take a couple of these specifically. And air pollution is something, as I said, when we, we were just observed uh, in the 90s that yes, there was a rise in air pollution. Subjectively, we felt it. We got the objective data from the Pollution Control Board and we found some associations. We could not really uh, have a direct cause and effect kind of a relationship. But we kept on and we uh, actually published this data in current science where we had looked at 1,625 human samples and correlated that with the ambient air pollutants across the months, across the years, over a period of five years. And we found a very significant negative correlation between semen volume and suspended particulate matter, as, we, as it was called then. And also a negative correlation, a very significant negative correlation between sperm concentration and SPM. Uh, as one looked at more data that came in a little later, there was a study in Athens, Greece, where they look at, uh, again, air pollution parameters, primarily particulate matter, and they found a significant decline in semen volume as well as sperm concentration over the years, and they had looked at over a period of 22 years. And uh, there was also a corresponding market de de deterioration in air quality. So we do know air quality across the world has declined, some places more, some places less. But construction, vehicular emissions, uh, primarily use of diesel, et cetera, contribute to it. So these were the papers in the 1990s. And then this continued. And uh, I was pretty excited to see this paper in toll booth workers because we had this interest in look at the constable at the traffic booths. And what we found was that this paper came from Italy and they looked that in toll gate workers, you know, who were sitting there for hours together while the vehicles passed. And there was a significant decrease, you know, the total motor, motility of the sperms, forward progression, uh, whatever functional tests were done. And sperm kinetics were lower in compared to controls who lived in the same area, but obviously not as exposed as the toll booth workers to uh, the pollutants. And also when they looked at sperm concentration, total sperm count, motility, etc., they were all significantly lower in the men who worked at toll booths as compared to th those who lived in that same area, but did not, were not assigned uh, or worked at those toll booths and not constantly exposed to vehicular emission. And they also had high DNA fragmentation. So our theory that yes, traffic pollutants, primarily emissions, were uh, responsible for a decline in semen quality and specifically sperm concentration. Uh, then the, last year, there was a meta-analysis which looked at air pollutants specifically and found that exposure to air pollutants at a higher level was associated with impaired semen quality, including decline sperm concentration. So what started as a simple observation over a period of five years, then a second study with which we reported, then another study which came from Greece, and then gradually many such papers came, and a meta-analysis last year clearly gave the analysis uh, uh, Gave, the, uh, gave us a clear picture, yes, air pollutants are associated with impaired semen quality. Now, how does it work? Why would particulate matter actually affect sperm spermatogenesis or sperm concentration? And in this study, which was done, and in this particular thing, a study where they actually looked at the exposure and found that throughout entire spermatogenesis, if they had a high, uh, exposure to both TM, PM 2.5. At that point of time, we would categorize the particulate matter. They were called suspended particular matter. Now we call them PM 2.5 and uh, particulate matter at 10. There was a high correlation between both these exposure and it was a temporal release. So if you were once exposed for a longer period of time to the air pollutants, then there was a decrease in sperm count. So it was not only the amount of pollutant, but the duration to which they were exposed to the pollutants. Uh, it was established that it caused a decrease in sperm concentration. How does this work? And in this one particular study, they actually used the mice model to see the mechanism by which the air pollutants, primarily particulate matter, impaired fertility. So they had mice who were constantly exposed to diesel exhaust particulate uh, chronically, and they found that it impaired the fertility uh, uh, of the male mice. 
and they found that the sperm count and motility was of these uh, diesel exhaust particulate exposed mice was significantly decreased. So clear cut, there was evidence that exposed the mice to diesel exhaust, there was a decrease in sperm count. And then they studied an immunohistological staining uh, and found that there were double stand breaks demonstrated during uh, chronic exposure to DEP uh, or to diesel, expo uh, diesel exhaust. And even the repair mechanism was disrupted. So clearly it shows that, they, and then RNA sequences also showed that testicular expression of the testicular genes, including the GNRS signaling pathway was impaired with exposure to particulate matter. So this clearly showed that particulate matter not only brought about a decline in sperm count, but they showed that the mechanism was because of double-stranded breaks that occurred. Today, even in the men, we are very concerned about DNA fragmentation. Possibly it's one of the tests, but of course, uh, there are uh, you know, a lot of questions on whether uh, debates on how it has to be done and how, how reliable it is, et cetera. But, in, but this study clearly showed that yes, particulate matter affected male infertility by directly acting and affecting the DNA and gene expression. So this is definitely a great cause of concern on what is happening. And if this continues, we do not know what would be the stress generation effect. So I think while the world is worried about air pollution and its effect on our lungs, if it affects, but if it's going to affect the future generation, it's something which is indeed a great cause of concern. Now, the second way lifestyles have changed dramatically is the use of pesticides, the green revolution, yes. Uh, and it has become a most suspicious agent and we do know that many of the uh, pesticides act as phytoestrogens and cause, uh, you know, affect spermatogenesis, especially if the lady who is bearing a fe male fetus is exposed to pesticides. And clearly it is because of the uh, pesticides acting as estrogens and because of the acting as estrogens, fetal exposure causes a negative feedback, decreased FSH and low spermatogenesis. So, and if again, you know, these pesticides can be accumulated in the adipose tissues. And again, that can further diminish FSH production because there'll be a negative feedback because of the elevated levels of uh, estrogen and this causes the effects. Now, what is the study show on the exposure of pesticides? And this exposure, again, this study published just two, three years ago, what is its impact? And you can see that although DDT is now banned, but one can see that when exposed, the testicular disease, the frequency with diseases or with other pesticides is pretty high. It's extremely high as compared to controls. And even if one looks at literature, looking at plastic, dioxin, pesticides, and jet fuel, you can see all of them cause testicular disease. And these exposures are increasing by the day, uh, by the day. In another study, and this is a transgenerational effect. Now, in another study, which is, uh, you know, somewhere they looked at dry, dry bromochromophenol uh, and 26,000 males were exposed to this as they were applying this pesticides in the fields. And 64% of these men and 90% of the men studied from Pilios fields had azospermia and oligospermia. Now, 90% having oligospermia among the people who used who, uh, who, uh, who were applying this pesticides in the field. And one can look that it's nearly the entire population spermatogenesis was affected. Also, what is the sad part was that this particular pesticide was banned in certain Western countries, but its sale to Southern Asian or the developing nations had continued. This is an old study more than 25, nearly 25 years ago. But it was shown that it did affect spermatogenesis in a drastic way. And even in 19, 1977, it was clearly known that DBCB uh, dibromochloropropane actually caused azospermia in all the men who were exposed to this pesticide. Uh, of course, this is no longer in use like in DDP, but remember that the pesticides, whatever is used, is not, it is not just the applicators or the manufacturers or the people working in the factories that are exposed, but anybody who consumes fruits, vegetables, meat, anything, milk product, uh, would be exposed because indirectly it would enter the food chain and the final consumer 
will be exposed, although not in as high concentrations as the manufacturers or people working in the factories or the fields, but everybody is exposed to these pesticides. Then plastics, you know, it is in the 1990s, I would say that plastics invaded, the plastics have been there in different ways, but I distinctly remember plastics invading us in the 1990s. Till then, children carried water bottles to school, but still at home, we, one never had plastics. Bottled water came into India, I would say around the late 80s or early 90s. And plastics now, you cannot imagine a home or an office without plastics unless one takes very special care. And it is there in bisphenol A is there in plastics, it is there in linings of cans, it is there in linings of glasses, dishes, etc. Even if one directly doesn't use. And phthalates is there all over because it, uh, you know, it's an ester of phthalic acid. And it is uh, added to plastics to improve their flexibility, trans, uh, transferability, their durability, and the longevity of plastics. And they are chemically bound to plastics, so they are continuously released. It's not that it's an inert unit. And phthalates have been found in breast milk, and phthalates have been found even in the human body, in all human fluids. Now, to draw your attention, you know, we feel we are buying very high-end plastics. But we also find, you know, lunch boxes, et cetera, which are made. But we also find that, you know, stains from especially Indian food cooked in oil and ghee are formed on the plastic. So there is a two-way leaching process. And over a period of time, it's, if it's a one-time use, it's okay once in a while. But if one is regularly using them, surely this plastic would be leaching into the food and then entering into our bloodstream and into the body. In studies done with bisphenol A, there are series and series of studies. They have found that mice exposed to bisphenol A at birth for a very short period of time. Uh, and they found that in male mice exposed after sexual maturity, sperm count was significantly lower. And two of the three strains of mice are affected. So it may not be that everybody is affected, but some are more susceptible. Now the question arises, plastic bottles have, have are become a part and parcel of life of uh, people across the world, would bisphenol A and other plasticizers, etc., which may be used in plastic uh, components, would it be effective? And more so, we are talking about young children, uh, and if they are feeding bottles of young males are made of plastic, and it is warm, warm, warm milk that is being fed to the toddlers, would it be affecting human sperm counts in future? Is a question that is being raised. So these questions do come in. Then if I go further, obesity, surely it is another pandemic which is set off setting in, you know, it was said that in uh, uh, humans, there were about 400 million obese men in uh, 2005, 2015, it went down to 70, 50 million. And according to the uh, WHO, by 2025, one would anticipate about 1 billion obese uh, human beings. Out of that, 650 million adults, 340 million adolescents, and even children. So surely it is something which is of great concern. Again, why is it so? Well, one of the concerns is the sedentary lifestyle that has set in, uh, you know, increased calorie intake, processed food, all these do contribute. Now, why is, in what way do they contribute? Why is this life? Is it just that because we are not burning enough calories? The fact is that obesity, we have an increased number of adipocytes and physically there would be infertility because of uh, rise in total temperature, erectile dysfunction, sleep apnea, which will again, you know, uh, disturb normal rise in uh, uh, testosterone and also sleep patterns. Also with rise in uh, obesity, uh, we know the fat cells secrete estrogen. So estrogen will cause a negative feedback, affects spermatogenesis and may lead to oligospermia and even esospermia and increased DNA fragmentation in index. And because of the increased estrogen contributed by these uh, fat cells, again, there would be a decrease in testosterone because of uh, you know, the high estrogenization, increased insulin and increased leptin. So overall, the endocrine system goes for a toss because of obesity and the hormones even produced because of the obese cells. The third major change, apart from, I would say, the pollution, pesticides, obesity, is the sleep and life pattern. Surely the day-night cycles have changed. 
earlier it was only people who worked in certain professions were uh, you know exposed to a shift in sleep pattern today we are doing it out of choice you know people have lifestyles where they would sleep very late possibly you know sleep in the wee hours of the morning and that is also because uh, uh, you know of the use of smartphone and tablets one is working in different time zones whatever the reason but what they found that when there was an increased smartphone and tablet usage in the evening it negatively correlated with sperm motility there was uh, it also had a negative correlation with sperm progressive motility including and also sperm concentration and naturally if there is a high incidence or negative correlation with sperm motility it has it increases the number of immortal sperm and the sleep duration positively correlated with total sperm total and progressive motility so basically sleep pattern seems to be having and today we are seeing more and more paper papers coming in on the impact of sleep patterns on various aspects of human life so i would like to conclude by saying that yes you know uh, there is definitely a global decline in sperm count the decline in sperm count is associated primarily with many factors but ones which i have highlighted are air pollution uh, pesticides plastics uh one is one plastics uh, which are of serious concern we really need to take our environment much more seriously and i think societies like ours we need to reach out to the public and make them realize that it is not just affecting you but the subsequent generations and we need to give it much more thought because what we feel is our progress what we feel is technological progress actually may lead to the downfall of our own civilizations we will not need earthquake we will not need pandemics to destroy our own civilization but we are technology if we do not realize how to use it smartly it may lead to a downfall maybe not in the very near future but surely we need to look at it much more seriously than what we are doing now so with this i uh, end my presentation on this infertility awareness week and i really thank cooper surgicals as well as uh, the ifs that our sig could talk about this very important topic so thank you so much thank you so much dr rajvi for this elaborate uh, presentation but sometimes you know the plastics uh, cannot be avoided altogether like the milk which comes in plastic bags and the bottles these companies who uh, claim to have highest standards and they are marketed by all the big hospitals and these chiku and all these so they somewhere we have to you know have a anti plastic drive pesticides how to you know keep minimum you cannot have organic food but to wash them properly there has to be a drive to stop this decline and this pump count so and how it affects right from the womb till the last and probably fertility awareness is not as much as it should be so um, more and more gadgets and more and more electromagnetic field and especially males are more in that so the impact definitely is huge and uh, not uh, well you know well thought but yeah I, and I you have highlighted it so well probably we as a group have to make this drive fertility assessment drive something like that yeah yeah i guess if we start giving people the message of moderation and yes. using things where absolutely necessary to get these things out of life is is, is by uh, acting very uh, to you know very foolish to say okay we are not going to use vehicles we cannot do that but at least certain at least if people realize then automatically moderation would come in let's hope yeah thank you thank you dr rajpreet thank you thank Thank you, Dr. Raj. So, ma'am, we have two questions. If we can quickly take them in the Q and A. Mm. So, first is from Pita Goswami. So, she is writing. We have seen these drastic changes in young males as compared to the older males, especially from rural areas. Younger generation has a different lifestyle. They are more into smoking and alcohol. So, our question is: smoking itself exposes them to higher level of pollutants. Have you also seen something like this? Yes, Dr. Geeta. I mean, it is very well, uh, you know. There's enough published literature, and we all have seen that smoking, yes, is a big contributor. And apart from that, you know, in India, especially, we have every local area having their own addicts. So, if you go to Gujarat, you know, there is there's some kind of uh, what they have as mawa. You go to the north, there'll be gutka. Even if it is banned, it's available. 
Yes. So I'm sure Dr. Sunil Jindal will bring across all these lifestyles and habits that people have across the country, which could be in a way contributing to the thing. So and another question is actually more, I think, will be to an embryologist and as well as to the neurologist Dr. Sunil also. So it's by Sabi Khoja. So his question is that his first semen analysis test was 56 million count and 35% motility. Later, second, it was found 30 million and motility was 40%. So he's asking for an explanation. So I think if I you want Dr. to answer, Dr. Jindal is the I right person to answer. I wouldn't directly want to say it is due to lifestyle or environment. There are so many factors. Yes. So I would leave it to Dr. Jindal maybe after he completes his talk because he's the yes. right person. I think the question will be automatically answered post his talk. Yeah. yeah. So, ma'am, uh, thank you, Dr. Rajvi. So now let me introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Sunil Jinder. So let me share my screen. So our next speaker is Dr. Sunil Jinder. He will be talking about clearing myths about male infertility. So Dr. Sunil is the scientific director, neurologist, and reproductive medicine specialist at Jindal Hospital and Fertility Center, Meerut, from 1998. He's working as the as a uh, neurologist and one one of the first neurologists in India I know personally who was into embryology as well. So he's the vice chairperson for Delhi SR and Delhi IAG. He's an honorary professor at VIMS. He's a co-researcher at Global Andrology Forum. So he's been responsible for bringing 7,500 uh, 7, babies into this world with infertile couples and giving them the hope. And this included fewer records as well. His area of expertise is male infertility, andrology <laughs> laboratory and clinical practice, and surgical sperm retrieval. He has more than 200 national and international publications, more than 16 publications, and eight book chapters. Over to you, Dr. Sunil, and thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be part of this program. Over to you, sir. Uh, so we are uh, we, we are not yeah. able to hear you, sir. Yeah. You're muted. Uh, so no, still, still, still nothing, sir. Still nothing, sir. You are not muted, but we are not able to hear you, sir. Not yet, sir. Still, still nothing, sir. Still nothing. We cannot okay. hear you. No, sir. Not yet. I guess maybe, sir, you can log in again. Log uh, on. Anyway, I think uh, there's something wrong with the mic, sir, maybe because. We can directly join from the system if it's okay, sir. You can use the computer audio if it's possible. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes. Perfectly. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah. The, prob <laughs> the problem was that uh, when you started on, you had me muted. So yes, this, mi <laughs> this microphone of mine doesn't want to be muted. And it always <laughs> does this. So I think that's what happened. Anyway, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much, IFS, Dr. KD Nair, a close friend, Dr. Sureen Guman, who always is inspiring. Ritu, whom I've known for a long time with her husband, whose name is Mahavir, which is a beautiful name. Dr. Shalini Chavla, always active. Dr. Aditi, and of course, Dr. Rajvi Mehta, who could miss her out. Uh, I never knew, I never knew you look after Cooper as well. I honestly thought you were just a scientist who loved science, but it's nice that you're able to contribute to Cooper. And of course, Wakil, who thought I would be good enough to speak over here on a public forum. So he told me it's a public forum. So my slides have nothing scientific about them. There is no data, there is no evidence. It is just, I've tried to make the program as seven myths, five facts, and a few FAQs. The YouTube incidentally has made me very, very aware of what people want because reading their com comments, answering them, makes me understand at a deeper level, which I never knew earlier, of what they really want and how they really want it. So I would like before this, I would like to, before starting, I'd like to share a few things the way I, and a few stories which have happened in my life. And one of them is that I can never forget, this was 2002. In 2002, this, I remember it was 14th of August. 
because 15th August was the next day. And this gentleman came into my clinic in the morning and he said that, uh, I would like to, I'm just going to end my life. I want to commit suicide. So I thought before committing suicide, let me come and meet you. So the first thing which came to me is that suicide note mein naam mat daliyo, baaki jo kehna hai, keh le mujhe. But anyway, <laughs> this gentleman came to me and I looked at him. I asked him what was the problem. And he said something very interesting. He said that uh, he thinks he has erectile dysfunction and he thinks he has no sperms. And his parents are forcing him to get married. So why should he get married? And if he gets married, he's going to end his life. Because for men, having a low sperm count and erectile dysfunction is catastrophe. So I asked him his history. I came to know in his history that he was having morning erections once in a while. And I got a semen analysis done. It came as, okay, in those days, the semen analysis was not 15 million. It was much above it. So he was good. So I still remember I gave him a tablet of vitamin C and I told him that, well, at the time you're going to perform on the first night, please put it onto your tongue and suck it. And I still remember distinctly. In the, there was no mobile phone at that time. So he came running at that time in the morning just to meet me and tell me that everything has been done fine. And then he had children uh, who incidentally were also uh, born naturally. So to a man like this, who actually has so much of trauma and problem because of a low sperm count, and there is nobody to attend to him, becomes a big issue. Uh, can you do me a small favor, Vakil? Can you spotlight me, please? You are spotlighted at the moment. So just a moment. I think I... Yes, sir, you are spotlight. Yeah, just put on spotlight. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll do it. Okay. So that just is... Make... Yeah. Uh, so I have pinned yeah. you. So yeah. you will be... You, will yeah. be spot... you pinned me, then you... Just pin me again. Uh, just a second, sir. Now is it okay? No. Yes, sir. Now okay. it's, I think... Yeah. Yeah. Now, now it's okay. You're yeah. spotting. Now, now it's fine. So I have a presentation which is just a few slides, and these slides normally have just a minute. So myths and facts about male fertility. So one of the biggest myths which people have is that infertility is always a woman's problem. Incidentally, every gynecologist would normally have a woman walking in with her mother-in-law. And if you ask the mother, when are you getting the son? She normally will say, Mera lalla bilkul theek hai. Would refuse to understand that a man can have a contribution. So the first myth which the world has is this. As doctors, we need to understand that the man has to come. And as a common man, I think this forum has... I was just checking out has about 60% of people who are there from the public. It's very important to just understand two things, that the contribution of the man ultimately is about 50%. This country has a population of 140 crores, out of which 15% are infertile, which makes it about 20 lakhs out of which 50% are infertility, which is related to a man, which is about 10 crores. So if you have a population out of which 10 crores is the men contributing to infertility, I think it's bigger than anything else. In fact, if you ask me, I was, I was seeing this beautiful presentation of the CEO of Coca-Cola. And he says two thirds of the world is covered by water and the rest with Coca-Cola. But let me tell you one small thing. In India or the world, it is covered by people who have infertility. Incidentally, no man shares that he's infertile with the person sitting next to him. 
So I always tell my patients that, well, when you're traveling in a bus or a car or whatever public transport, you never know. The person sitting next to you may also be having a problem, but nobody talks about this problem. So that is the first thing myth, that it is only the woman whose problem it is. The second myth is, it is always caused by low sperm count. So men normally come with a report and the report has a low sperm count. Most of the men don't know what it is because there's so many things written. So they normally take this sperm count and say, 20% sperm. Hai. That's it. That's what they say. But to be understand, to understand one thing which is very, very clear is every human being should know that it is not the sperm count. It is the motility. It is the structure, the morphology, jo shakl hoti hai sperm ki. And more than that, it is the functional capacity of the sperm. Like for example, if you have a police force of 100 people, which has 100 police officers, it is 100 police officers. But if you have a police force which has 20 policemen and 80 civilians, it is not a police force of 100 police officers. That is the way it happens with sperms. What you think is that the cause of infertility is only low sperm count. You'll be surprised to know that the biggest problem of infertility in men is unexplained infertility where the sperm count is normal, but the functional capacity of the sperm is low. So the second myth is, it is always caused by a low sperm count. Mera sperm bilkul theek hai. Aise kaise ho sakta hai ki mere bachcha na ho. This is important for even clinicians to understand and pass it across to people. One, I have a YouTube channel which incidentally is doing well. By it, I mean, I, haven't, I never thought it's going to happen like this. So one question which always comes in the comments is, ki meri zindagi kharaab ho gai, male infertility ho gai, ab bachcha nahi kar sakta, ye permanent hai. So male infertility is not permanent. Male infertility can be treated. And even if you have a low sperm count, with your own sperms or even nil sperms, with your own sperms, you possibly can get children. So this is something which needs to go across people and everybody needs to understand this third myth. The fourth myth is male infertility is always genetic. It's a weird thing, but patients normally would even come to you or talk to each other. Ke ye to anuvanshik hai. Ye to janam jat se tumhe problem hai. There are a few problems like, say, Kleinfeld, uh, Y chromosome, microdeletion a few other problems, a few syndromes, which have men who don't have sperms, but it mostly is not always genetic. It is very, very partially genetic. This is another myth which people have. The fifth reason is everybody says, koi na koi medical condition aapko hogi. There is some medical condition because of which you have male infertility. So, aapki male infertility diabetes ki wajay se hai, aapki male infertility tuberculosis ki wajay se hai, whole body checkup kara lo, kuch na kuch milega, TSH bada hua hoga, thyroid will be out, but well, that's not the way it is. It is not normally a medical condition which is associated with male infertility. Male infertility can be there singularly, where it, the way it is most of the times without a medical condition. Now, only with symptoms of infertility should you get tested. Very interesting. Very interesting because recently I posted a video on who are the people who should get themselves tested before they get married. And who are the women who should get themselves tested before they get married. Because a lot of young population, unmarried men, have major issues about the fact 
that they probably will not be able to have children. And therefore, there is a set of population which needs to be tested, even if they are not, even if the symptom is not infertility, especially if the family has a genetic disease, if they are sexually promiscuous, if the semen quantity is less, if these men normally have signs of sexual development or secondary signs less, if they feel they have less erection, if they've had some sexual inadequacy, then these men should even or could even be tested before they get married. And the seventh myth is infertility is not a significant issue for men. Well, I think the biggest significance for those people who have children is the insignificance of men who don't have children. So only a man who is infertile understands the importance of it. If somebody has a child, he never even thinks that it is important that your sperm count and your sexual function should be okay. Uh, I say this why? Because two things. First, male infertility is a barometer for the complete well-being of the man. The complete well-being in the sense, if a man has erectile dysfunction within the next four years, there is a 70% chance he's going to have a heart attack if he's had erectile dysfunction in youth. If his sperm count is low, there is, a there is a phenomenal chance that the man is also going to have some disease related to oxidation and aging. All these things bring us to a place that infertility is one of the most significant issue for men. Now, I've spoken about these things. Dr. Rajvi gave a very beautiful, I would say, scientific presentation on pollution, on uh, food, obesity, about plastics. But do we realize that the sperm count, as the study which she mentioned, came down 50% within a span of a few years? And this was a dated study. Today, the way pollution is increasing, the way plastics have become a part of our life, the way smoking and tobacco is more than before. Smoking may not be, but eating, chewing tobacco. I still realize when I talk to people that a man would not smoke with his father in our culture, but he doesn't mind sharing tobacco or gutka with his father. And the acceptance of gutka is so high because they actually feel it will not do what a smoke does or what a cigarette does. So smoking, use of drugs, uh, obesity, junk food, and above all, no exercise. One of the major reasons why a man is a man the way he should stay is if his testosterone is fine. And exercise is one of the main reasons which can increase your testosterone. And an enhancement in the testosterone not only gives the sense of well-being, it is also a very big modulator for the sperm production. Sleep, which Dr. Rajvi spoke about. Well, sleep is the most important thing to have, not for only, test, uh, I would say, sperms, but for so many other things. But please understand, the testosterone would only be normal if sleep is adequate. If sleep is not adequate, testosterone will not be adequate. And the moment testosterone is down, subnormal, borderline, or at the lower level of the normalcy, well, is going to have a low sperm count as well as sexual issues. So all these lifestyles which are so important to be used, to be kept in mind, is something which we should talk to our patients. I, the, my first video which went viral, I think it has about 1.5 million views now. More than that, I think. This was best ways to increase your sperm count, 12 tricks. And this had nothing else. It had just the lifestyle modifications which every patient needs. 
In fact, it is not medicines alone. 50% of the job is done by the lifestyle. And the moment you talk to a patient and tell them, kuch kaam mere karne ke liye, kuch kaam tumhare karne ke liye, aur bina mare swarg nahi milta. Believe me, patients do it. So I've talked about seven myths. I'm going to about, talk about seven facts. Male infertility can be treated. Even azoospermics, 70%, 60 to 70% of them can have their own children. Idiopathic, azoospermia, the most common cause can be treated, which is ROS. Unexplained infertility in men, mera sperm count theek hai, phir bhi mere bachcha nahi ho ra. Can be treated. Hormonal problem can be treated. And those whose sperm count cannot improve, their quality can be better. And with that quality, if needed, ART can be used. So male infertility can be treated. This is one big fact. Second is, male infertility is more common than what many people think. 1% population is azoospermic. Can you imagine? 1% population. 7% of the world population, man is the cause of infertility. 7% in India would be about 10 crore people. Lifestyle choices can impact male infertility. TV ke saamne chips khake, Coca-Cola khake, bina exercise ke, raat ko kam neen leke, Netflix dekh ke, agar aap sochte hain, bachcha paida kar lenge, to ye aapka mughalta hai. That's not the way a child is born. And if you really think that you can eat all junk food all day, be obese, and smoke on top of that, and that you are going to have a good sperm, even if your sperm is fine, its DNA fragmentation would probably be high. And this needs to be taken care of. This is the third fact. The fourth fact is sexually transmitted disease. Sexual transmitted disease is increasing. Promiscuity is increasing. Multiple partners are increasing. And it's important for men as well as women to understand that they have to take precautions or not have multiple partners. Or if they have it, they need to be treated. And if they have it, then they have to be very cautious about the fact that their fertility can be affected. And fifth fact, my God, so important. Stress is a major issue today. Padne ka fresh uh, ka stress, calm ka stress, public ka stress, webinar se pehle stress, society mein stress, milne ka stress. I mean, stress is everywhere. But the, day we, the way you deal with stress is the story. Because what happens is whenever you have stress, your cortisol increases. And this increase in cortisol decreases your testosterone. And it leads to most of the problems. In fact, the king of hormones, testosterone, is something which governs a lot of things. And the way it is declining today is something which is of concern. So I've spoken about five facts and seven myths. And uh, the very myths, lots of myths and misconceptions. I've just spoken about the sperm count. I've not spoken about the sexual myths because I have a presentation in which when I talk about the sexual myths, people realize, oh my God, I never thought about it. Oh my God, this is the way it is. But there's so many myths and misconceptions about male fertility and infertility. It's important to understand the facts and seek appropriate care and support. Male infertility is real. It's common. It's happening. Has a phenomenal mental and emotional impact on the man. Man is very sensitive about it. In fact, it's simpler to treat women than to speak men. And men are very private too. They don't share it while women can share it. Lifestyle choices, environmental factors have a major impact. And if you're struggling with male infertility, don't bother. Talk to your healthcare provider. Most of the people can have their own children and can be treated. I mean, in 2023, it cannot happen that with male infertility, you cannot be treated and you cannot have children.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jindal. So I'll remove the pin and spotlight. So we have a few questions. So first of all, I request Dr. Ritu to just give a concluding remark to Dr. Jindal's talk. I think there could not be a simpler way uh, to deal with the male problem in this. Uh, Dr. Rajvi had given the scientific facts and the way the thing should be managed has been taken so well by Dr. Sunil Jindal. We know he's a renowned andrologist and the way he solves the problem is also so simple. So I think your counseling itself must be helping a lot, Dr. Raji, uh, Dr. Sunil. You know, I'll but tell you, I, I now don't talk Counseling and talking yes, only, yes, you pull yes. the patient so much yes. and I don't think <laughs> no, he's I, a patient I, I, anymore. I, I have yes, realized, see. I have, you know, Dr. Ritu, uh, I have realized three things. We as doctors need to just give a little bit of time to these men. They're very sensitive. Women too. And from the time I've started doing that YouTube, all I do them is give them the links of different videos. And the moment they get those links and they understand the problem. See, uh, Dr. Ritu, it's, it's my understanding though. My understanding is that a common man needs simplification of a complex problem. And I think it's nice. And it's very nice, uh, Dr. Ritu, that you've given me this forum where I'm speaking just as I would speak on the YouTube. So yes, I never yes. knew I never knew that there could be a forum which could be like this. But 30%, it's very nice. 30% of the problems are solved by the way you talk, de-stressing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hardly yes. any question from our side. Maybe there are one in the chat box. Then there are a like few to... in the chat box and yeah. there are a few I have received also. So I'll, so I'll start with the question. So first is uh, from Vivek Kumar Mishra. So how diabetes causes the infertility? Diabetes has three ways of causing infertility. First of all, diabetics are very prone to have erectile dysfunction. If you are in an uncontrolled state of diabetes, by the age of 40, there is a 43% chance that you are going to have erectile dysfunction. And within the next four years, the chances are 60%, you're going to have a myocardial infarction. So my diabetes friends, if you are there, please understand, one of the main barometers and indicators for your diabetes, which is out, is this, and it leads to this. The second thing which happens in diabetes is there is a very high chance of male accessory gland infections. And getting these male accessory gland infections out in a diabetic man is hell of a job. Because the blood supply does not take those antibiotics and the diabetic milieu gives a beautiful culture media to these bacteria too. Yeah. Number three, there is also very high level of DNA fragmentation in diabetics. Yes. Diabetes, I mean, say ROS activity, if I must say. So ROS is caused a lot in diabetics. Diabetes causes a lot of infertility and sexual dysfunction. And retrograde ejaculation also is so common if the sugars are not controlled. It would normally happen if the sphincter goes out. Yeah. Or if there is a neuropathy which happens because of diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one more question from Sabir is, how is it possible to prevent themselves from such things like uh, plastic material and pesticides? Because even today, the fruits and vegetables, everything is sprayed with the pesticides. Uh, you want me to answer it? Grow your own food. <laughs> there is no other way. Look it's for so a person, difficult. Look, Look for a person who grows it and does organic <coughs> farming. Yeah, close to our place, there's a doctor, Dr. Prakash. And he has massive farms and he grows them completely organic. I mean, you will get organic milega, which is the way it is. And he earlier used to do it for himself and now he does it for a few companies. So that is one. Number two, the second thing was plastics. Hmm. Well, I think it's very simple. I even have ceramic cups. I have plastic bottles. And I mean, we can use plastic. You can, we can avoid plastics. I mean, that can be done, but we normally get things in plastics, which is a problem, I know. Mm -hmm. But the world needs to understand. Otherwise, like Dr. Rajvi said, beautiful thing. It will not need an atom bomb to make you extinct. It will need just the common plastic. Yes. Khatam. 
इट विल सरवाइव इवन आफ्टर सो सो नई कहानी पता क्या होगी हिंदी के अखबार में चाइना ने मार दिया हिंदुस्तान प्लास्टिक दे दे के आई थिंक एंटी प्लास्टिक ड्राइव शुड बी देयर इन स्कूल्स राइट यू नो एज दे हैव दिस एंटी क्रैकर्स एंड चिल्ड्रन आर वेरी वेरी कॉशियस अबाउट एसपीएम फैक्टर लाइक वी आर नॉट सो मच यूज्ड टू पुट दिस एयर प्यूरिफायर्स इन आवर रूम्स but the children come and they minute they say see what is the spm you are not putting it don't go for walk this is it so that thing has to incul- be inculcated right from the school that the eating habits especially when the school canteens have these colas and chips so the healthy eating has to come right from there same way for exercise same way for uh, you know stress it is nowadays these things are growing at school level rather than you know uh and they are so much children are so much into stress and eating wrong and working all the time without no exercise no break so it is basically de learning becomes very difficult once they become into uh, by the time they come to us so in schools only they have to have this habit in our times we used to have that prayer meetings and pt and yoga so all those things are not existing nowadays so the things are going wrong at the root level yes. so yeah i agree what dr ritu said and basically you know i feel the simplest way is just to curb the plastic especially the water bottles you know we can have the steel water bottles and not the plastic bottles so these are just the simple steps which we need to take right at the grassroot level the people need to be made aware of the harmful effects of the plastics uh, totally we can't avoid it but yes certainly we should need measures to decrease the amount of plastics today uh, in our lifestyle and regarding pesticides i would like to make a comment it is always better to uh, wash your vegetables before cooking in the warm water peel off the wax like for apple they put wax in the morning in the sabji mandi if you go at 4 am or 5 am you happen to pass they are very brightly putting up the wax and putting up sticker one is california and another is shimla ka apple so you have to wash the vegetables very very thoroughly you have to suppose you are taking uh, non seasonal vegetables if you are eating cauliflower in summers so make sure you keep them in warm or lukewarm water for 10 15 minutes uh, minutes before you cook them so these small little measures they can help reducing we everybody cannot have access to so called organic food and the study says that so called organic food also has 23% of pesticide vis a vis the local food in which is 39 to 48% so there is nothing totally organic also we have to take care at the uh, uh, at our own level i mean to say yeah and one message i would like dr sunil jandal to give it on the public forum especially the increased use of mobile phones and the screen which probably i feel is leading to an increase rise in the low sperm count so sir what's your take on that no it's very interesting i came across yeah. five studies and the first study i came across was a study on uh they taken sperm they taken semen and mm-hmm. they what they did was they had semen which was incubated and they had semen which was incubated with mobile phone continuously ringing i mean the waves going on and they realized that the survival of these sperms as well as the motility of these sperms went down phenomenally we all know that it is a fact it is a fact that uh, mobile phones if these mobile is kept in the pocket in the i would say trouser definitely would be affecting on a long term because it is not that the radiation is only there when it rings the radiation is continuously in the phone another thing which you will be surprised to know is that the radiation level which you have in the towers in india is higher than what they are abroad because it's simpler is cheaper to have these towers and the fourth important thing is that um, it's not only the radiation which affects it is also a lot of um i would say um um it does not only affect it also affects the production of the sperms at the level of the spermatogonia so this is one thing which is true but whenever i have told my patient ki aap apni jeb mein yahan phone mat rakhiye 
तो वो कहते हैं जी ऊपर वाली पॉकेट में रख के दिल थोड़ी खराब करेंगे देन आई रियलाइज कि भाई इन लोगों का करो तो करो क्या तो दैट इज दी वे यू कैन डू दिस इज बाय हैविंग just like dr rajvi those beautiful ipods in your ear and having the phone kept somewhere that's the simplest way you can use your phone so i mean there is no other way man decided that he will procreate but technology is deciding that bachcho tumhe dekhte hain abhi dekho tumhara kya karte hain so this is the story which has happened and also Sir, the e and e yeah it is very important to tell them to switch off the uh, you know wifi in the room where they sleep because say for 8 to 10 hours the mobile is also there and that emg circuit is there either they should put their mobile in the other room or switch off the wifi of the room where they are sleeping and madam also often your alexa it listens to everything yes, you yes, say yes 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 google home <laughs> alexa off them off them and your these... and your and another thing i'll tell you your um, uh, webcam mm. should always have a lid if you think that you have a webcam and your computer is on sleep and it will not see it can see oh so this is the this is the beauty about i would say technology we yeah. are pursued everywhere so yeah i need to guide my son to on this this web camera is on <laughs> that's the way it is yeah and dr sunil jindal i mean just uh, this thing like you said to use uh, airpods or you know so while i was attending one eng lecture so then they said if that increases the deafness so you all are caught up like we all are caught up in a mess like you use phone then keep it away if you use airpods it increases the deafness so technology is taking us at all on us actually <laughs> madam <laughs> bibi sirf ek cheez aapko khush karti hai pata hai kya bibi ki dot <laughs> उससे पता क्या होता है ना तो डेफनेस होती ना उससे इस तरह की कोई कहानी होती बट फोन यस डेफिनेटली कैन लीड टू अ ऑफ इश्यूज कैन आई शेयर जस्ट वन स्मॉल इंसिडेंट मतलब जस्ट इन वन वर्ड सी ड्यूरिंग कोविड फॉर वन पर्टिकुलर टाइम से फाइव सिक्स मंथ्स वी ऑल स्टॉप डूइंग दिस थिंग आईवीएफ स्पेशली फॉर फाइव सिक्स मंथ्स दैट पीक सेकेंड वेव so so many patients who were you know under stress of working and they were living inside devoting time to each other and uh, you know having healthy diet used to wash vegetables on their own and having normal uh, spending some time with yoga and something so so many patients who were on uh, ivf list almost you know 30 to 40% of them conceived naturally during that period so probably you know living the old kind lifestyle has to come some way at least for reproduction if not for madam madam aap aap gurgaon mein rehti hai it professional bechara saath rehta kahan hai covid ne mauka de diya covid ne mauka de diya yes they could stay together yes they could have time yeah yeah that was a meme abhi bilkul recent that india has surpassed the china's population because of the effect of the covid where uh, there was an increase in the number of children born abhi to sawal uth rahe hai ki do we need ivf or not because we have already surpassed the ask the patients the question ask the patients we heard this question from ivf as you don't ask me ask the patient who is struggling to get a child to ivf ask this question to them not to me so we have few more questions i think we will quickly uh, take it sir the question is from dr isha sharma so she has a patient with endospermia with varicocele which is grade 3 so will doing varicocele surgery help him and how should she should counsel him indication of varicocele surgery is very simple you should have a woman who can conceive who does not have too much of a problem the sperm count should be have some parameters which are not correct there should be a varicocele which is clinical subclinical needs not to be operated and number 4 if you see that the ros activity and the dna fragmentation is high all that's the fourth one which i am seeing is which has recently come out so these three things if they are there together you can suggest the patient to be operated then the next question is from akash mahangre how vitamin c improves sperm count vitamin c is a beautiful antioxidant it's a uh what a soluble antioxidant so there are so many antioxidants which are so expensive i think the best amul butter is the cheapest and the best similarly vitamin e and vitamin c is beautiful vitamin e becomes a fat soluble vitamin i mean say antioxidants 
and vitamin C is a water soluble antioxidant. Both of them do a great job. And in most of my patients in the antioxidants, which I would normally give, I normally try to give them vitamin E and vitamin C. The problem with vitamin E and vitamin C is that you need about 500 milligrams of vitamin C, which is a large tablet, which normally people cannot pack in the complete system, which needs to be given to the patients. Vitamin E would be 400 international units, which needs to be given. So that's the reason they probably are not normally there in the vitamins which you are giving normally. But in the antioxidants, these vitamin E and vitamin C are to be given and in every literature and every, I would say, meta-analysis normally has vitamin E and C, which has been studied. Yes, sir. So then we have a next question uh, from same Dr. Isha Sharma. So she has a patient with uh, non-obstructive azospermia, FSH is 15, normal testosterone levels, and the patient is ready to go ahead with surgical aspirations. So will giving any drugs prior to aspiration will going to help him? Aspiration would not give you a, normally a baby in non-obstructive azospermia. It's a non-obstructive you're talking about, no? Yeah, so non-obstructive. So in the, she has again written. Non-obstructive. So in an obstructive, in an yeah. obstructive azospermia, you could use a aspiration. aspiration. In a non-obstructive azospermia, especially since the FSH is slightly raised, <clears throat> the yes, testosterone so, is normal. So one more uh, twist is in the same case. The, in the above case of azospermia, there is a varicocele in the same patient. So will okay. there be chance of recovery post-surgery? Okay. Now, how much was the testosterone? Uh, it, she has written normal, uh, not the value. Okay, See, now, you... now I'll I'll just now I think it was a public forum, but since it's become a doctor's forum, let yeah, me just uh, let me <laughs> let me just talk about it because yeah. so non-obstructive azospermia, there is no role of any aspiration. The best procedure for these patients normally would be a micro TC if it is non-obstructive azospermia. The FSH is high, and if the testicular size is small, it is non-obstructive azospermia. Micro TC would be the procedure of choice. You would normally give a patient anything which would increase testosterone if the testosterone is low. Normally, I would like a testosterone over 300 or 350. And if I want that testosterone, why do I need, want it? I want it because of the reason that in case of non-obstructive azospermia, you need an intratesticular milieu of testosterone. An intratesticular milieu of testosterone is not the same as the serum testosterone. So to these patients, you normally would like to give clomiphene or you would like to give these patients letrozole if the E2 ratio is deranged or you could give these patients HCG and giving these patients these three drugs could give you a good testosterone. So once you've given them clomiphene, if the testosterone comes in normal, that is the time you should go ahead and do a surgery for them. Surgery. Now when it comes to the other thing known as varicocele, there have been a series of papers which have shown that in non-obstructive azospermia with clinical varicocele bilateral, after operating on the varicoceles, sperms have appeared in the semen. Now, the question is, would you operate or would you not operate? If you operate, you have to be very clear that you need to do a microsurgical varicocelectomy. Because see, the test spermatic artery will only be seen under a microscope. And if you tie up the spermatic artery with the veins present over there, you're actually going to do more harm than doing good to this patient. Hmm. So, so, so the next question is how laptop radiation can affect male fertility when the laptop is being used by putting it on the lap. So actually using the laptop as it name sounds. Radiation and heat. <clears throat> radiation and heat. Yes. Indeed, sir. Okay, sir. So then one more comment is there is eating onion is best for some extent of infertility? Onion is something which I saw a paper, I've even made a video on that that has gone very high. Onion, if taken raw in a particular quantity, enhances testosterone. Mm. So any enhanced, though a lot of other things do, like anything mm. which has omega-3 fatty acids, yeah. anti- uh, oxidants, they also do the same thing. But onion has been shown to do this. So the next question is also interesting. Does Ayurvedic medicine is effective on male infertility? Um, it's a very nice question. I'll, I'll, I'll answer this. <clears throat> Why? Because I want to answer this. I always used to consider till the time I started reading about this that Ayurvedic drugs is something which is 
um, a placebo or it doesn't do work. I thought about making a video on ashwagandha for which I read about 14 international published literature. And once I read that literature, I realized that the biggest immunomodulator and stress reliever, natural, which was available, was ashwagandha. And the only thing was procurement of pure ashwagandha. So I checked out where it could be available. So then I came to know that roots of ashwagandha were available directly from the farms. And these are the roots which need to be extract, not extract really, you can uh, grind these and have that root, which is very good. And these not only decrease stress, they, and you know, it has not, just understand another thing. It increases memory. It's an immunomodulator. It leads to, um, I would say, better sleep. So there are a lot of Ayurvedic things which actually are good, which can be combined by us in the therapies which we are giving. Like meditation is not Ayurvedic. It's Indian. And I think meditation is something which the whole world has started taking on. And I read a beautiful paper in which by meditation, the testosterone levels increased over a period of time because stress was relieved. When stress goes down, cortisol goes down and testosterone goes up. Yes. Yes, sir. So one last question. <clears throat> so can sexually transmitted infections lead to male infertility? Like patients suffering from gonorrhea, syphilis. Yes. Those yes. people are also prone to have. Yes. And the reason is simple. It leads to a lot of uh, oxidation. Leads to high level of ROS. Hmm. It leads to blockage of the VAS. It leads to infection in the VAS and blockage as well. And um, it leads to anything and everything which is possible. And when you have all these infections, it further on also leads to addition of bacterial infections. Mm -hmm. So it does. It does affect. So, Vakil, I would like to add about, you know, the Ayurveda aspect. The maybe good, uh, Dr. Ritu Jain through the Gurugram Gynecological Forum had organized one webinar just about a fortnight ago. And we had some Ayurveda experts. What came out strongly is that we need to be with the right people. You know, because there are a lot of claims with Ayurvedic medicines and there's a lot of over-the-counter uh, prescriptions or, you know, people go and take the drugs, which is creating problems, which is, you know, we, they're not in the right dose, the quality of the drugs. And unfortunately, we are not aware and we blame the entire science. And yeah. it is true because the quality is very, very crucial and we go to the right people. So somebody who has done a one-week course or something over the net on Ayurveda starts prescribing or self-medication. It does a lot of harm to the individual as well as to the ancient subject. So I think there are studies now coming up, like Dr. Jindal said. I was very surprised to see a couple of papers which are there on male infertility. And they are strong studies, you know, done and published. So I think it's time we start sort of working to see how they work. Maybe they don't have the mechanisms available. But uh, some of them have proven their efficacy. So I guess Dr. Rajvi, our like SIG is the right appropriate, which is like the holistic approach, you know, where we should uh, take the advantage of guiding people about the lifestyle, about the meditation, about the yoga, about the Ayurveda drugs. So uh, I think it's the holistic approach which really plays an important role and not just the cause and the allopathic treatment and the IVF or maybe the drugs like that we use. So I think it's been a very interesting discussion. And Indeed. as the convener of the SIG of Holistic Health, I would like to thank Vakil and Cooper for organizing this and my co-conveners, Dr. Shalini, Dr. Ritu. And thank you very much, Dr. Jindal, for joining in and you know giving us this very clear message for the open forum. Because male infertility is so highly neglected. I always start my talks when I talk about it, stating that people talk about uh, gender discrimination in India. As far as infertility, all the gender discrimination is towards the female. You know, even the number of gynecologists, how many members in Foxy and how many members who are actually doing andrology. Uh, you know, they, they possibly not there uh, even in three figures were actually doing proper andrology. So, you know, right from what you talked about, the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law coming from treatment to the diagnosis, 
to all aspects, it's so neglected. So I think, I hope we have, in this infertility awareness week, we have increased the awareness and maybe we can start focusing more. So thank you all of you for joining us. Dr. Rajvi for making this happen. Thank you, Dr. Jindal, Shalini. Thank you yeah. very much. Thanks, uh, Dr. Jindal. So, thank you, thank you Dr. Ritu. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Shalini, and thank you, Dr. Rajvi, for thinking about me to join this. In fact, this is so simple for me nowadays because I speak more on YouTube than on the scientific forums. So speaking to people becomes simpler for me. And uh, thank you. You made it very simple. Uh, spare some time for us. We will. We would like to have you for male infertility in Gurgaon. Possible? No, that will be that will be a pleasure. That will really thank be a pleasure. You. Thank you. And thank you, Vakil, and thank you, Doctor Aditi. Welcome, sir. So uh, before logging out, I would request to switch, uh, look into the camera. So I'll just click a picture. Thank you. So thanks, Vakil. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajvi. How many logins on the Facebook, Vakil? So, ma'am, I have to check. So, we had like 90 people in the live session which were yeah. attending on Zoom. Yeah. 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 So, oh. thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you, you Rajvi. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you all the attendees for attending the session. The session will be available on our Facebook page of Cooper Surgical India which can be accessible at any time and Zoom recording will be there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Bye-bye.